Welcome to the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. I am the host, Attorney John Kasravi, and I practice U.S. immigration law exclusively. For more information about the program, please visit www.immigrationlawyerspodcast.com. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the podcast. We have a, a great and special guest, someone we've spoken before, Jonathan Wazden. Jonathan Wazden does federal litigation in the immigration sphere, has crazy awesome background uh, being in the immigration litigation field on the government side, so he comes with a wealth of experience. Um, we have a different uh, podcast episode I'll put in the show notes where I did a full interview with his background. But I wanted to jump in and have a quick interview about a recent lawsuit he did that was just recently filed to talk about it, what it means, because it's the kind of stuff that's affecting all of us in all our cases. So, John, why don't you just start with uh, letting us know what this lawsuit was about that you recently filed? Sure. So, everybody is familiar with the term mandamus lawsuit, which is what you file when the agency is taking too long to give you a decision on your, your application. There, that falls under the All Writs Act and the Federal Code and the Mandamus Act. There's also in the Administrative Procedure Act a cause of action called unreasonable delay, a challenge for the agency taking too much time and it's not reasonable. So the, the legal standard that you've got to prove for an unreasonable delay case is actually quite a bit easier than the mandamus. So we, we went with the, the APA unreasonable delay uh, cause of action. And really what we're targeting is the agencies, the way that they have structured the H-4 extension and H-4 EAD process to prohibit these folks from ever getting work authorization. So in the complaint, we lay out certain changes that have happened to the H-4 extension petition adjudication and also the H-4 EAD adjudication mm -hmm. and how the, the way the agency has structured those changes means that people will go without work authorization for at least 13 months on average. Wow. Because, uh, yeah. And so the way this happens is, you know, they're very clear on their website saying, you're... EAD ends automatically when the H-1's visa ends. So they're taking forever to adjudicate the H-1 extension. So you can't work during that period of time if, if the H-1 is expired. Then once the H-1 is approved, instead of reviewing all of these documents for the entire family all at one time, they'll review the H-1 extension. Then when that's done, they'll send the H-4 to some other office. They'll adjudicate the H-4 extension. When that's done, they'll send the EAD application to another place. Wow. Yeah. So they, they have, in pure government style, made this thing so incredibly inefficient that you can never get anything. Now, if you're one of the folks who's, who's primary H-1, was only approved for a year mm -hmm. you would go through this whole process before the process gets complete you lose your application because the primary h1 is expired now is this for premium processing as well because i know premium processing they do them all at the same time or are these non premium process cases they used to do them all at the same time as premium processing so they changed that in May. and, and which do is know, do you know if that affects l1 because i've been done an l1 since uh, in a couple of months I believe L1s are a little different because statutorily L1s have work authorization as part of the visa. So that's all they need is their, their approval notice and they're good to go. Technically but that's the, the case, but uh, I think with E2s as well, I think they're, they're supposed to be able to get uh, work authorization just simply by having approval. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, with the way things are and the inconsistencies, I always follow the EAD with it. And as for E2s as well, I get that before they do it. Um, but that's incredible out there doing these things. So um, when did you file the case? I want to say it was either Thursday night or Friday night. I forget when, when but it was uh, late in the evening on one of those two days. And so for a lot of listeners, just get a better understanding of how federal litigation works. What's the next thing that happens now? So you file your complaint in federal court, and then the court will issue the summons. And this little stamped copy of the paperwork that says, you are being sued. Mm -hmm. So then you have to serve the summons on three different folks. There's the U.S. Attorney's Office, where you file the case. There's the U.S. Attorney General in D.C. And then there's the Department of uh, Homeland Security's General Counsel Office. 
you got to send the service out to those three folks, wait for that to come back, upload that to the court system. But once they've been served, the agency has 60 days to answer the complaint in federal court. The vast majority of the time, the government ends up adjudicating your petition before that 60th day comes around. Mm -hmm. Because usually the only answer that they've got is, I'm sorry we took so long, Your Honor, we're incompetent. And, and that's just not a good defense to have to throw out there. Yeah. So I mean, when I was in the government working, defending these cases, it was really just like twisting arms on the agency side to get this done quickly, because I don't want to have to go in there and get yelled out by the judge. How many plaintiffs are there uh, in this case? There's four. And so there's a possibility they might just adjudicate these four so the uh, cause of action could move? More than likely, yeah. And so you know, the, the reality is this is the problem. They, they engineered the system to cause a massive problem. Mm -hmm. And that problem is not going away with just one lawsuit. So yeah, the, the goal is to turn this into a situation where you can start doing these in bulk at a cost that's pretty close to premium processing for these folks mm. so that they don't get so jammed up by the system. And uh, so with four cases, they could do that. Now, you had a previous H-1B filing lawsuit that you tried to get a bigger group so it could force its way onto the court. And I think the judge accepted that. Uh, what's going on with that case? So in that case, we had a hearing on the summary judgment motion, and the court had a lot of questions for the government, including why is there is such an astronomical increase in processing delays in fiscal year 2018, mm -hmm. and what the intent of the government was in creating these new rules. And she said she ordered the government to provide explanations on those things in the form of declarations from agency heads, <laughs> and also. Uh, she supported the government to explain why discovery shouldn't be ordered in this case to get at some of these issues. So they filed their uh, motion or their brief. We filed our re reply brief, I want to say a week and a half ago. And so right now we're just waiting for the judge to see if she's going to order discovery or not. And this ordering of discovery is going to be a big deal for the case? Yeah. So as a general rule, you never get discovery in these cases. Um, it just you're not supposed to ever get it unless the agency has failed to create a record for their decision mm -hmm. or has acted in bad faith. And that second problem is where we're going. Nice. Is bad faith, which the agency helped us out quite a bit on because in their declarations to the court explaining delay, we were able to refute every single assertion that they made about <laughs> why the delay was happening using the agency's own numbers that they publish in their, their annual reports. So, uh, you know, the big, the big explanation that they had in their declaration was uh, the massive increase in H-1B petitions caused the delay and the shortage of adjudicators caused the delay. But we were able to go through, through and show they raised their fees in 2016 so they could hire more people. They hired more people. They've increased the number of service centers that are adjudicating H1s. And the percentage of H1s that have increased is only like 3.8% year over year. So, so we tracked it out. You know, So we had 5% increases on H1s and processing times were going down for three years. And then we had a 3% increase and processing times went up 200 and some odd percent. Mm -hmm. So clearly, you know, it's not a, not a matter of receipt volume. And they have additional employees doing this. And other visa categories using the I-129 were not similarly impacted. Yeah. You know, we, just, we just had a whole bunch of information. And the agency publishes how long it takes them to do a 129 adjudication which is 46 minutes per adjudication. Really? For H1, H1 adjudication for I-129? For all I-129s. Really? Like for an L, it takes 49 minutes? So yeah. uh, on average, every, every product that they do under that form, on average, takes 0.83 minutes to accomplish. Interesting. And so that, that was the, the metric that they used when they were creating their fees in 2016. 
that we were able to use that and say, okay, you could have a team of a thousand adjudicators doing every single H-1B that's filed annually, and they could knock that out in three months at that rate. And, you know, but these things are all filed at once or spread out throughout the year. So there's clearly something else going on here. I mean, God bless the agency for throwing out so much data that we could use against them because it was very helpful. Well, wonderful. So definitely keep me posted. I'm going to have you on in the coming months to keep us updated on these events because it's like hurting. It's hurting everybody. It's hurt, I mean, hurting clients, hurting law firms, spending, wasting time on our fees. Um, USCIS employees themselves are frustrated about this stuff because it seems like these are commands coming down. They just want to do their job to a large extent. It's being forced on them. And it's hurting American businesses not being able to properly plan for the future. We need, you know, part of the international movement of people is employment. So it, it doesn't make sense. And frankly, the numbers of H-1Bs aren't that large that affect the workforce on some grand scale, the way they make it out to be uh, with the numbers. So uh, God bless you in the work you do. And uh, definitely uh, going to bring you on board. If someone wants to contact you to, you know, they might have litigation case or learn more, what's the best way to contact you? Probably just shoot me an email with a, a copy of the decision or a brief summary of whatever, what's going on in their case is the easiest way to do it. Oh, and what's your email address? This is J.D. Wasden at economic-immigration.com. Okay, great. I'll have that in the show notes as well. John, thank you so much, Jonathan, for coming on board again. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Catch you later. Bye-bye.